I have to say, I feel like a rock star. This is amazing. Wow, so many wonderful humans out there. Not so uh, skeptical now, are we, about psychology? Love life and enjoy every moment. Am I on? Oh, sh yeah, I am, and I nearly swore as well and all, eh? Um, so just down a tiny, t <laughs> tiny bit if possible. Hello, everybody. How are you? That's good. Has it been a good day? That's good. It's hard back there. You can't understand a word. It's, there's just so much. Look, I have to apologize. Usually I come on wearing bright, bright florals. My daughter is about to give birth. I'm talking really almost about to go into labor, right? And I've been at her place down near Nara, and I, she wants me to be at the birth. And I've been there looking after the two-year-old and trying to take care of my daughter and driving up here, and I haven't had time to get changed. If you don't like what I'm wearing, stiff. <laughs> I put the lippy on though, love. <laughs> okay. So um, I, I just uh, wanted to, uh, there was something I heard today, and I'm sure the, the gentleman that said it um, as I arrive, r arrived, I heard this, saying that people who think too much about the past aren't very nice people. I'm sure that's not what he meant. Um, because I just want to say that people like me with a lived experience of mental health issues, most of it is based in trauma. And very often, it's very hard to not think about the past. So I... I'm not against the medical model. I take medication. Um, unfortunately, for those of you who've seen me, you already know this, I apologize. Um, unfortunately, the medication makes me shake. This is a, a lithium tremor. Um, but using a sense of humor, I've come to see lithium as a friendly drug. It's not, it's terrible. But, you know, I say that lithium's a friendly drug, it waves, it makes a good cup of tea, a good martini, I did that in a boys' school talk once. <laughs> People with mental health issues ha feel vulnerable. You know, you feel vulnerable, and it's the vulnerability that, that other people pick up on. And other people pick up on that, and they sort of meet that with a, often, a, a kind of, stigmatizing or discriminating kind of attitudes, you know. And it's really important for all of us to understand that people who feel vulnerable can actually be incredibly strong, and we often are. And, and the way I talk about us, it's like, you know, the are there any Japanese people in the audience today? Uh, you might know the name of it if you are there, um, where Japanese people make these beautiful, beautiful pots, and then they break, break them, or if they get broken, they mend them with gold. And they say that the value is where the cracks are. And I think that's very true of people, um, of all people, but especially people with lived experience of mental health issues. And our trauma does make us think about the past. But if we take everything about what our experience has been, everything, and we offer that, in service to other people, then what's happened to us in our trauma, our traumatic past, can even be a, used in a glorious thing. I'm not saying that I wish trauma on anybody. I don't. My trauma was based in sexual abuse as a child over a period of four years. Um, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. But before we start laughing about this, I wanted to tell you something that happened. I was speaking at Luna Park. At a, <laughs> I love speaking at Luna Park about mental health. Um, <laughs> at a very large conference, and uh, there was, I was up, and I usually start my talk about, you know, I have lived experience, and I was sexually abused as a child, blah, blah, blah. And there was, um, while I was speaking, 
there was quite a bit of chatter, which is really unusual. Usually, people like you are really quiet and you could almost hear a pin drop, but, but there was quite a bit of chatter and I'm thinking in my head, what am I doing wrong? I need to adjust what I'm doing. What are, you know, I should be do saying something else. This is shit, just, you know, oh, there you go, I swear, sorry. Um, and, and then a woman stood up and she came towards the um, stage and I said to her, and something that I think we all should be is brave enough to be vulnerable. And I said to her, did you want to say done something, darling? So I was prepared to give her my time. Okay? And, and she said something in a different language. And then the woman behind her that came with her interpreted. So there were a number of interpreters people from different language, from different countries, not being able to speak in English. And so she said she did want to say something. So I invited her up on the stage and I gave her the microphone. And she told me that she'd come here as a refugee um, from uh, asylum seeking actually, from another country, Middle Eastern country, her and her children. She'd been here in Australia for five years and couldn't see until today, until she'd heard about the women and children in Australia, and, and men, we know too, of course, um, get raped um, and murdered here as well. But she didn't know that about Australia. And now that she knew that that could happen to people here, as it did to her and her children, rape as a weapon of war. Now she knew that she could call Australia home. And then another woman came and she said the same. And another woman. And the staff stood up and started to come towards me. I said, no, get back, stay back, let this happen. And I said, we've got to get off the stage, you know, keep this safe. So we got down on the stage and I swear, about 30 people ended up all in a huddle, hugging each other and crying because of our past, because of the trauma, but also out of relief and recognition and care and gentleness and compassion and love for each other. Even though we didn't know each other, we loved each other. So whatever has happened in our past, you as psychologists or whoever you are, if you can support people to take what's happened to them and try to make something good out of it, then it hurts a whole lot less. And we don't have to keep navel gazing about it. Working forward and working for other people is what makes that have less of a damaging effect on our lives. So that's the serious bit of this. I wasn't gonna talk about that, but when I heard that, I thought, hang on. So I talked about that. However, I do think that humor is a very important part of us being able to recover. And it's certainly something that has helped me, you know, so that the, the, the jokes about the, the medication. But there are so many things. When uh, I have, uh, I'm not into diagnosis. I think diagnosis can be very damaging for people. Sometimes people are relieved at first, but over the course of a life, lifetime, I think, Diagnosis puts people into a box and does more harm than good. If you want to focus on people's needs, people's symptoms, okay, but their needs is what's most important. Focus on that. So anyway, um, it was, it's something that I feel that having a sense of humour really helps you in every component. And when you've done, of your life, and when you've done some things like I've done when I've been manic, like running naked down the street singing Oklahoma at the top of your voice. You've got to get a sense of humour about that, you know? You know, particularly as I get older, because when I was young and I'd run naked down the street singing Oklahoma, it would take a while for the cops to catch me, right? But now that I'm older and if there's a headwind, The cops don't take any time at all to catch me now. They just want me off the street, you know. And into, 
So if you've done stuff like that, you've got to find a sense of humour. And also, the people around us should be allow us to enjoy those times. So an example is, um, I probably shouldn't say the name of the chain, but a very large supermarket chain um, was in our town. I lived at Kayama, so now you know that. Just look it up, you'll know who the supermarket is. Um, and when I was manic, I used to go down there and welcome people at the turnstiles as they were coming. Hello, welcome, you're looking lovely today. There's specials in such and such and so and so. And when I'm manic, I have an amazing memory. I've got a dreadful memory the rest of the time. But when I'm manic, I've got an amazing memory. And I would take note of everybody that came in, what they were wearing, how they felt, we have very high um, in instinctual recognition of different types of nature and people's experience when we're manic, you know. And I would sort of absorb these people coming through in, uh, into the supermarket and, and would decide on who would make a good partner with who else <laughs> had come through. And, and, and Woolworths never moved me on. They never moved me on, which I thought was really fantastic, you know, that they didn't usher me on. And so I'd say, oh, you look beautiful, darling. Come with me. There's somebody I want you to meet. <laughs> and they would come. They would come with me. And I would take them and I'd introduce them to a man if I thought they were heterosexual. I'd introduce them to a woman if I thought they were lesbian, you know. And, and get them together, you see. And they had something in common. The nutter. <laughs> and it was amazing. I would go back around, you know, an hour later perhaps, and those people would still be chatting. <laughs> and there was another big um, corporate chain that started a hotel just next door. <laughs> oh, it took a while. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fantastic. I used to love doing that kind of thing. But people take us just too seriously. And when people take that too seriously, that kind of thing, when it's outside the box, outside what society thinks we should all be acting like, we've got to smack it down, we've got to squash it, we've got to poke it all in, make sure there's no, not even any little bits sticking out the top. Squash people down, they've all got to conform. Oh, bullshit. I think that's terrible. I don't think we should be conforming. I think we should be accepting people as how they are. So many other societies don't have this term mental illness. So many societies accept people who, who have what, what the medical model calls psychosis as shamans and things like that, you know? And certainly, we can be tortured by our voices. To, you know, I experience voices, and they can be, they get at my Achilles heel, you know, they really know what to do. And they can really be very active after I've done something embarrassing. I remember there was a time, um, I wish I hadn't looked up there, I'd, I hate this. <laughs> there was a time, um, <laughs> I'm bald there, that's no good. <laughs> there was a time when I was young and I was manic, and you know, you, you know when you, you're going to sneeze, you know, you can feel it coming, yeah? I'd been after this guy for a while. I was sitting in a bar, at a bar with him, and, and he's sitting on stools like this, and we got to the point where his leg was there and there, so we're in luck, and I thought, it's going to be a good night. And you know, that sensation where you're going to sneeze, either I didn't get it or I took no notice of it. And I sneezed. We were this close together. And this golly came hurtling out of my nose, all 
almost touched the end of his nose and flung itself down across my face. What do you do? And walked out. But you've got to laugh at those kind of things, haven't you? You know, like my husband has learnt to laugh at these kind of things. I've got this thing where I, I forget lingerie. I buy beautiful lingerie. I don't bother anymore. I'm way past it now. But I used to buy beautiful lingerie. And I've gotten a lot bigger over the years. And I used to take a 10 AA when we first got together, a kiddie starter bra. And now I'm rather voluptuous. 60. What about it, ladies? But I'd forget about this. And I'd find rather large bras hanging on the end of our bed. And I'd pick it up and go to my, whose is this? <laughs> Who the hell is this belonging to? It's yours. That, don't try that one on me, brother. And that went on for years. And now he loves it because it doesn't matter what lingerie I find, I never ask him. <laughs> He's got it good. But really, people say to me, you know, how, how does your husband cope? <laughs> um, and I say, oh, it's really quite easy. When he's depressed, uh, he plays a lot of golf. When I'm manic, he takes a lot of Barocca. <laughs> and for that reason, both he and I hate lithium. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, there's been some of the most funniest things that have been the most embarrassing. And you've probably all done this. Not, you know, when I was young, there was no such thing as texting, let alone sexting. And my last really large manic episode, I sent my husband a really lewd text. Really lewd. It was just between him and me, so I knew he'd love it. So it was really lewd. I didn't hear from him all day, and I thought, What the hell's going on here? Finally, he walks in the door. I've cooked a mediocre dinner because I hadn't heard from him. And I say to him, you didn't answer the text today. And he said, what text? And I said, the text I sent you. He said, I didn't get any text. And I thought, shit. <laughs> I'd sent it to the local president of the Rotary Club. <laughs> because when you're manic, you just do things very excitably. And you don't take too much care with how you've gone about doing it. I'd sent, I, so I picked it up and I sent another text to the, to the president of the Rotary Club. And my husband said, what are you doing? And I said, I can't, if his wife or children pick that up, I didn't say George in it, I said darling. If his wife or children pick that up, how's he gonna explain that? So I wrote back and I said, I'm very sorry that text was meant for my husband, not for you, and you know. So people with lived experience care. We care and we try to undo the damage that we've done when we've undone damage. But please help us to understand that we are tiny in this huge world that, in, that includes past, present and future. And those little things that we've done that might have been aggressive acts, and we only ever become aggressive when we're afraid. So if you can help people to feel safe, 
they won't become aggressive. Okay? That's all you have to do. You do not have to call the police for them to come with their tasers and guns and, you know, anyway, it's another conversation, isn't it? Help people feel safe. Help people to laugh at what's happened. Don't laugh at them. Help them to laugh. Help them to feel inspired to use whatever they've done, whatever trauma they've experienced as well, to support other people. Help them to find a way of making meaning and purpose from everything that's happened in their lives, our lives, your lives. We're here for a purpose, and those of you who had seen me speak last time, you would know that I'm passionate about everybody. You have a duty to find and enact what your purpose is here in this world. No matter what's happened to you, and I've seen when I've been in psych wards, a man save a woman's life who was hearing terrible voices yammering at him and he was trying to cope with them, you know, shut up, shut up, shut up, you know, and saw that this young woman was really, really afraid. And as he approached her, she was sitting beside me and she was trembling from fear. As he approached her, he stopped interacting with the voices and said, I can see you, I can see you frightened, darling. I can see you frightened, I, I, I can see you frightened. You, you're, you're amongst family me now, darling. We, we'll take care of you, we'll take care of you. Faye will take care of you. Would you like a cup of tea? Would you like a cup of tea? I'll get you a cup of tea. And she said, yes. And he, he said, how do you have milk, sugar, milk, sugar? And she said, yes, milk and one sugar. And so he said, I'll, I'll get it. Faye, you'll take care of it. And he went off, ah, oh, shut up, you know. And he made the cup of tea and he brought it back. And as he got close to her, he stopped the yelling at the voices again. And he gave the, the cup of tea and said, there you are, there you are, darling. You'll be all right. We'll, we'll take care of you. We'll take care of her, won't we, Faye? We'll take care of her and he backed away. And she told me that that cup of tea, that gentle man trying to deal with those voices, saved her life that day because she'd already worked out where she was gonna hang herself in that ward. So no matter where we're at in our life, help people to realize that we have meaning and purpose and we're capable of serving each other and having meaning in our own lives. Thank you for having me.